All right, so now I'm going to call up our brother Aaron Mosley with a special announcement for you guys. All right, good morning. How's everybody doing? All right, that good, huh? All right. <laughs> Perfect. Um, well, we're here to um, kind of do something special today. And for those who don't know, my name's Aaron. Uh, this is my wife, Jackie. I'm the director of the Bridge uh, Restoration Ministry here in Napa. My wife's the director of operations. Um, it's, for those who don't know, it's a 12-month residential discipleship program aimed at those struggling with addiction. So today, we're here to honor one of our brothers and recognize the work that God has done in his life uh, as we graduate and recognize the completion of this program today. So Cole B., come on up. All right, so we, we made it. He did it. I didn't think he was going to do it, but he did it. Praise God. It's all glory to God. So we just got a couple minutes. We just want to really recognize and highlight what God has done in this brother's life. So like I said, this is a 12-month residential program. Cole's been here for 16 months. <laughs> he really liked us. So, you know, really what we want to kind of highlight is the immaturity that he came in with to the maturity that we now see in this brother in Christ. And um, for anybody who would want to discount or discredit, well, like, yeah, dang, he's been here for 16 months. Yeah, he went through some, some real difficult stuff and had to uh, kind of bear up under it and submit to the leadership, uh, submit to the Lord. And I don't think we've seen um, a more radical transformation at this point than Cole. And, I mean, all the brothers, I mean, it it's really is to be noted that God's doing amazing work. But this brother in particular, um, God's done and doing some real special, real special work in. Cole's somebody who will discount himself a little bit and even discredit himself. Um, but I, I just want him to be encouraged that he really has become a man of God, and we acknowledge, we acknowledge that maturity. He came in immature, lost, entitled, I mean... And I don't mean to just hammer on him, but God has just, <laughs> God has really just squeezed that out of him. Um, and the man you see here today, again, this is a new creation. This guy has, yeah, praise God. So we acknowledge, <laughs> yep. So the, the coal that we see here, this is not coal. Coal, the old coal died. This is the new coal in Christ. You know what I mean? So the coal that we have today is not, is not who came into this program. And as a matter of fact, there was a time shortly after he started right outside here where he wanted to, he was done. He's like, I'm done. Can you take me home? I said, no, we got service getting ready to start. You can walk home if you want or you can stay. And uh, he opted to stay and wait for a ride because he was lazy. So he waited. <laughs> and um, whatever happened, God did something. And just that night, he really felt like the Lord told him he needed to stay. And really ever since that point, has been growth upon growth, and there was some difficulties and hardships there, but um, as far as being s submissive and respectful and just wanting to, to do um, as he was kind of instructed to do, I mean, he's just, I'm really impressed with, with Cole and what he's done. So again, recognizing, I mean, he came in lost and broken, and he submitted his life to the Lord, and he is, he's been radically converted now. As he's getting ready to graduate, he got a job working for uh, Thomas Keller up in Yountville. So, you know what I mean? It's pretty amazing. It's pretty radical. So we praise God for that. And um, I'm going to just turn it over to my wife. I could sit here and talk for a while uh, about, about Cole and the things that we've seen change. But anybody that knows Cole can acknowledge and recognize that, that that's the truth. So... There's a verse in Hebrews that um, says, submit to your leaders because they uh, have to make an account for your souls and, and do it so that they may have joy. <clears throat> and I just want to say what a joy it has been um, with Cole. And I know when he first came in, I did not like him. I was like, I didn't understand what was happening with him. And I t called her and I was like, I'm not working with this guy anymore. And, uh, but what, what Aaron said is he has been 
completely transformed. And I just enjoy Cole so much and the kindness and the tenderness that is in his heart and the genuineness that he has is such a joy. He is such a joy to be around and he's just one of my favorite people to hang out with and he just makes me laugh and we just have a good time. And so it's been uh, just such a privilege to watch the transformation that um, he's gone through and what God has done in his life. And so it is um, my favorite day. Graduation day is always my favorite day because we get to just acknowledge what the Lord has done. And um, it's just, it's exciting to see um, how far he has come and all that God has ahead for him. And so we're just so proud of him and just want to thank this church body for the support um, that you give to the bridge and to be able to witness these lives transformed is um, really special. So we thank you and thank you, Cole, for just being um, submissive and staying with it and being such an example to other people that come through um, the program because if we can just acknowledge as adults, we don't want to be submissive. That's not like what our heart desires, but to really be able to surrender your life to not only to the Lord, but to leaders that God has put in your your life is not an easy task for any of us. We don't like to be told what to do, but um, Cole has been a tremendous example of being um, submissive and then the fruit that has come from that. So um, it's going to be great to watch him just pay attention to this guy and see all the things that God does in his life in the next few years in the way that he'll be able to um, come alongside other people and encourage them to do the same. So we're really proud of you, Cole. You did a great job. Amen. And I think Jackie had kind of already highlighted, but I just want to kind of backtrack a little bit and say again, like this, we thank you guys for your support. I mean, this is what you're supporting. You're supporting a work of the Lord, and there's actual people associated with this. This isn't just some some entity that you don't know anything about. You can actually interact with people that you support, and, and so you get to see the fruit of what God is doing and how God is using your support, prayers, finances, all those things to change lives. So lives are being changed right here in this church, and so I mean, this is an exciting season to be a part of this church, in my opinion, this specific body of Christ, um, as we are really gearing towards just uh, radical, gospel-centered, um, evangelistic-type ministry with the bridge. I mean, that's what this is. First and foremost, it's, it's the gospel, and that's what's changed this brother, is Christ. And so thank you again, guys, for partnering with us. Um, do you have anything you'd like to say? Okay. <laughs> I, draw, I didn't prepare him for that, so I figured he was going to say no. Um, he is going to be giving his testimony, though, on Thursday at 6.30 on next month, first Thursday. So you want to come learn about how God's really changed his life? Come check it out. You're welcome. Um, so before, before we get started, I'm going to go ahead and pray for Cole, um, and then we'll turn it over. Oh, yeah, I apologize. Before we do that, we got this fancy certificate here for Cole. I'm going to go ahead and turn that over. So I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then we're going to get out of the way. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity we have to stand beside our brother Cole and just truly acknowledge what you've done in his life. Uh, truly, Father, the man that stands here now is not the man that came into this program. You've worked uh, really miraculously in his life. You've called him. You've drawn him. Uh, Lord, you've set your affection upon him. You've given him a love for you, Lord, and a love for others. And it's just truly amazing. We, we praise you and glorify you for this brother's life and the work that you've done in his life. We just ask that your hand would continue to be upon him, that you'd lead him and guide him, that he'd always seek you first, Lord, that he'd always prioritize you, understanding that you, you are the only constant, uh, unchanging, immovable thing in his life, and that you will never leave him or forsake him, Father. And uh, so may he always, again, just put you first, and we pray your blessing on him in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. That is a, that's a worthy cause, amen? amen? A worthy cause. It's, uh, man. If you, I mean, I don't know if you guys, you guys probably already know the dudes, but most of the brothers sit over here in the front corner for whatever reason. I don't know if that was an assigned seating or what have you, but 
you guys got to get to know these guys, uh, you will just have your minds blown by, uh, man, what's going on in the program. It's just amazing. They're a massive encouragement to me week in and week out, and uh, just watching the Lord uh, transform is just, it's amazing. Blows my mind. I hear these guys pray, and I'm like, where'd you learn how to pray like that? What's going on here? Been saved for like six months, praying like, you know, the prince of preachers over here. It's just amazing. Anyway. I'll be quiet. Um, yeah, thank you guys for your, your partnership with the bridge. Um, all glory to God. Uh, and then finally, before we get started today, I forgot to uh, remind y'all that, um, you know, we're just going to keep announcing for the next few weeks, if you guys have been around, if you've been listening to the series for the past few months and would like to be a member at Calvary Napa and you haven't either had the chance to do so or you've been on the fence or whatever have you, there's prayer cards in the chairs in front of all of you. All you need to do is write your name on there and say, I would like to be a member. And you can stick it in the offering slot, which is behind Brother Russ right there. Oh, you didn't have to move. I thought maybe you'd raise your hand or something. Yeah, there you go. Okay, cool. It looks like a mail slot, but it's not. Um, so yeah, you can just drop it right in there. All right. Okay. I'm going to stay here today. So we're going to be in John chapter 12 this morning. If you guys want to flip over there, I'll give you some time. John chapter 12. I got that Your Majesty song stuck in my head, so if I start humming it, just forgive me. Jesus Christ, Your Majesty. It's a good one. So John chapter 12, I still hear some flipping. Flip, 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 flip. We'll get there. All right. Palm Sunday today. Let's pray before we get into God's word. Father, you are powerful and glorious and good. And God, we just thank you that we can celebrate you this morning, Lord, that we can watch uh, your work in front of our eyes as you call broken things, God, and as you save and make whole and transform and bring dead things to life, God, only you can do this. And this morning we give you the glory due to your name. We thank you so much for your word, your many great promises, God, your wisdom, your love, your encouragement, your Son, above all things, we ask, God, that you would speak powerfully to us through your word this morning, that you would refresh us, Father, in your love and your grace and your mercy, and that you would give us hope for today and for eternity as we consider your Son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, today is Palm Sunday, for those of you who didn't know. I don't know if you get an alert on your... Apple Calendar or whatever. I know I get alerts for all these holidays. There's literally a holiday every single day on the on the iPhone. If you look at it, it's like these bizarre things that I've never even heard of. Whoa, that's an intense ringtone. So uh, today's Palm Sunday, Jesus' triumphal entry, as it's called, into Jerusalem. And I'm just going to confess to you guys that I was greatly, greatly humbled uh, by my time preparing for this particular subject uh, I had something that I was working on for quite some time this week, some hours, and uh, when I got done with it, I honestly hated it. Like, I literally looked at it, and I was like, this stinks. This is horrible. And that's honestly, it's really rare, because usually in my study, I'm very excited uh, because the truths of the Word of God are just ministering to my heart and mind, and I'm just full of joy and, and excitement and reverence, and I can't wait to come in and teach it. There's just all this anticipation and freedom and all that stuff. Not with this one. Not with this one. I spent a lot of time staring at my computer screen, writing, deleting, staring, deleting, staring, reading, listening, staring, deleting, staring. And then uh, I ended up talking with a good brother uh, who's teaching kind of the same text. 
and getting some perspective from him, and I walked away from that conversation just in a, I was a mess. I was like, oh, man, it's even worse now than, than it was a minute ago. It was like, it was great. He encouraged me. He tried to help me. But then I was like, man, I really know I need to just go control or command A, <laughs> delete. And so uh, I finally got to the point of just accepting that I had just missed the point. I was missing the point of what's going on here. Um, and I don't like to listen to too many of other people's sermons when I'm preparing for a topic or a text uh, just because I don't want to preach someone else's message. You know, it's like one, once you listen to someone's sermon, you're like, oh, yeah, that was a good point. That was a good point. And then you start, yeah, I might just do that. Next thing you know, it's like, okay, I'm basically just repeating verbatim what somebody else already said. So I like to be pretty well done with what I'm going to present before I start listening to that kind of stuff. See if there's something I missed. Um, and I'm not going to preach another man's sermon, but praise God I decided to because I got the perspective switch that I needed, I think, to pull this whole thing together for me to understand it and hopefully for us to understand this day better. And so here we are, Palm Sunday. This is Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And it's an interesting name for this event in Scripture considering the, the circumstances that surround it. And based on their Varying perspectives on the event. Some writers have called it the tearful entry. One pastor called it the ironic entry. And I suppose each of these has some truth in it in its own way. But I think the thing that stuck out to me more than anything when I finally kind of <laughs> grasped this text was that it is indeed a triumphal entry. It is a triumphal entry, and that is why this name has stuck for us through history it is a triumphal entry, and albeit not exactly in the way that the crowds who were gathered in Jerusalem thought it would be, but it is triumphant nonetheless, and we'll get into why. But just a quick refresher here on where we are in the life of Jesus. So we know that this day is a significant event because it's found in all four of the gospel accounts, and so we ought to take note of it. We know that Palm Sunday marks kind of the beginning of the end of Jesus' life on earth. This is going to be the last week that he is around before he is crucified as he makes his way into the city of Jerusalem for the Passover. Very good. The Passover is a pilgrimage feast which uh, Jews uh, would come from all over the world to celebrate. Wherever they were, they would make the trip to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. And we know that Jesus is actually coming from Bethany, which is a town nearby. It's about two miles, so a short walk. And this is a place where he had just recently raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. This is a magnificent display of his power, and it's going to play a big role in the week that's leading up to the crucifixion. And now, as you can probably imagine, news of this miraculous feat had fallen on some ears by this time, right? If somebody got raised from the dead downtown, you know, you guys would probably hear about it, yeah? News spreads of this kind of stuff, pretty miraculous. And because of that, there was a large crowd, we're told, that gathered there in Bethany both to see Jesus and to see the risen Lazarus, right? You would be like, wow, okay, there's a guy who raised the guy from the dead, but I want to see the dead guy too. Like, is he, is he all skin falling off or what's the deal, you know? So there was a huge crowd that came uh, to see what was going on here as I'm sure uh, any of us would have done if we would have been there. I know I would have been there. I would have sprinted uh, or whatever. I don't know. I definitely wouldn't have drove, but I would have hopped on a donkey or something. So that's kind of the backstory to where we are for the triumphal entry in John 12. And now before we go any further, I want to remind you guys of John's purpose statement, right? We've been in the book of John, or at least we were in the book of John, which seems like in distant history now, but we will be getting back into the book of John post-Easter. So we got three more messages to get through, Passion Week, and then we'll be back in John 6. But I want to remind you guys of John's pur uh, purpose statement, because it's only fitting since we've been making our way through his gospel, and I'm pretty sure I've read this every single time I've had the opportunity, and now is as good a time as any. So John, speaking of the things that Jesus did and telling his audience, there are many more things that he did that aren't even written here. But he says in chapter 20, verse 31, he says, But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, 
and that by believing you may have life in his name. Amen? So everything that we read is intended to guide us toward this end, belief in Christ unto eternal life. That is John's goal in writing. And so as the Lord would have it, if we survey the setting of Palm Sunday, we find, greatly enough, according to John, that people are coming to Jesus left and right because of the things that he's doing. They're seeing the signs and the wonders and the miracles that he is performing, and they are believing in him. They're following him. In chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus says to Martha, the sister of Lazarus, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. He says, do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. After raising Lazarus, chapter 11, verse 45, many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. And the Jewish leaders hate this, verse 47. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs, and if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. We can't let this happen. They even plot to kill not only Jesus, but Lazarus too. Chapter 12, verse 10. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. We see people are seeing what Jesus is doing, and they are believing in him. And this is amazing. I love this portion of John, because so often in the Gospels, we see people wanting Jesus to perform tricks. We see them wanting him to manifest a snack so they can eat some free food, right? They're following him around saying, oh, do something cool, do something cool. Show us a sign, show us a sign, right? Where was the bread? Got some more fish. Do you have both? We can make a fish sandwich, right? We're hungry. We want the free food. But in this setting, the people are coming to him and they're seeing his miracles and they are believing in him. And I believe that this is so key to understanding the triumphal entry in its proper light. Because the way this text has been taught many times over is actually to the fault of the crowds following him and to the fault of the disciples. That they only really wanted temporal salvation from Rome, right? They wanted Jesus to roll in there, take the throne, reunite Israel, overthrow the Roman rule, and establish the mighty kingdom once again. And I'll admit that I myself was predisposed to read the text that way as well, to find fault in the crowds, to find fault in the disciples. But my hope for this morning is that we can walk away with a better understanding of this day and a better understanding of what it means for us, and above all, a refreshed hope and confidence in our Lord. Amen? So we'll read John's account together today. We're going to cover just verses 12 through 19 of chapter 12. We're not going to do the whole chapter or we would be here all week. But let's start in verse 12. It says, The next day the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. And so they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord even the king of Israel. So the people are wondering at the end of chapter 11 if Jesus was going to come to the feast at all. Now up to this point, his dealings had been very private for the most part. He hadn't made this kind of public display or declaration that he is going to make here today when he enters the city. And so the people hear that he is indeed coming and no doubt there was a large crowd coming with him from Bethany into Jerusalem because they had seen what he had done with Lazarus. They had been hanging out there and, and understanding the story. And so you have a big crowd probably traveling into the city with him. And you also have a big crowd awaiting his arrival because they had heard of the things that he had been doing. They wanted to see this prophet. And upon his coming, upon his entry, he receives a wet... <laughs> 
A red carpet welcome. Scott was asking me earlier if I had ever flipped the words around uh, in, in this one text. I'm not even going to repeat it, but of course that would happen today. He receives a red carpet welcome. And we're told in other accounts that the people spread their cloaks on the road before him, right? They took their garments off and they laid them out in the street for him to walk on. And John tells us that they took palm branches, right? This is where we get Palm Sunday, right? It's not not palms, it's palms, right? Palm branches. We see them around here. They're not native to anywhere around here besides Southern California, but they're all over the place, right? So they took palm branches, and they laid them out on the road as well. And this was all to acknowledge and honor this man whom they perceived to be their king. And they were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And so the crowds, they are shouting or maybe even singing this partial quotation from Psalm 118. Hosanna, save us, save us now. That's what Hosanna means, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The king of Israel, Jesus, who said of himself in John 5, 43, I have come in my father's name. This is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And so there is great rejoicing and praising and singing and shouting as Jesus enters his capital city. Now, ironically, and I would say prophetically, Psalm 118 is also the place where we find another famous line. The stone that the builders rejected has become what? The cornerstone. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The king, the Messiah, the savior of Israel has come. And while the crowds cry out to him with joy and expectation, at the very same time, the religious leaders are plotting to put this man to death. Now, to deal with the reaction of the crowd. So many commentators have pointed out that the crowd are probably crying out to Jesus to save them from their circumstances, right? They're not crying out, Jesus, save us from the penalty of our sins and the coming wrath of God by dying on the cross to atone for us, right? That's not, not probably exactly what they're saying. They're probably crying out to be saved from Rome, right, to be saved from taxation, to be saved from being without autonomy, having to answer to the rule of another nation, and so on and so forth. And you guys have probably heard this before. And now, all of this is probably true to some degree. It's unlikely that as they cry, Hosanna, they are thinking, Lord, save us from our sins by sacrificing your life as the Passover lamb, right? They don't understand that yet. But the question is, is that something to fault them for? Is that something to fault them for? Or to take away from their rejoicing as honoring Jesus as king? And if you asked me a week ago, I may have said maybe. I may have even said yes. But after reading a lot, a lot of prophecy passages this week, it became very clear to me as it should to all of us, that they were calling for the very king that the scriptures had promised. They were calling out for the king that God had promised them. It wasn't just that they had their minds fixed on earthly things to the neglect of what Jesus really came to do. They weren't, they weren't fixing their minds on their circumstances and saying, yeah, we don't care about eternal salvation. We just want Jesus to come in and fix us and save us. It was that they did not fully understand how he would accomplish all things yet. And we're told in this very chapter that the disciples didn't understand either. And we see that over and over and over and over. Jesus is telling them, the Son of Man must be lifted up. The Son of Man must suffer many things. The Son of Man must be betrayed. He must be put to death. He's going to rise on the third day. And they're like, "Uh uh-huh, yeah, yeah. So when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel, right? They just, it's like, they just don't get it. They cannot understand this yet. But, In spite of that, their hope is in the right person. It's in the right place to bring salvation to them. They are crying out to Jesus for salvation. They just didn't yet comprehend the fullness of that salvation or the fullness of Jesus' mission to accomplish it. Does that make sense? And so for y'all note takers, this brings us to our first 
key point of takeaway. And I will beat this horse to death all day long. I am the resident horse beater. Church, be grateful for the scriptures. Be grateful for the scriptures. The privilege that we have to be able to understand these things, looking back in its completion, to have these accounts of Jesus' life, his miracles, his signs, his words, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, it's all written for us. We have apostolic commentary and clarification and correction and all of these things to have, to have the ends of all things revealed to us. I mean, we literally know how the, the eternity of the universe is going to play out. How amazing is that? Glory to God. That's it. That's all you guys got? How amazing is that? Hallelujah. It's amazing. Glory. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Javon. Count on you, brother. So we quite literally know the most important things in all of creation about the past, the present, and the future because of God's word. We have the fullness of his revelation to mankind, and we neglect it, don't we? Do we? Do you? I'll raise my hand. Does anybody else want to? Do we neglect his revelation? We all do to one degree or another. Thank you for your honesty. We all neglect his revelation to one degree or another. We are imperfect. We are distracted. We have to eat three, four, five, six times a day to survive, right? We can't spend all of our time in God's word. But I am calling us all here this morning, wherever you're at, to get back into the word. Wherever you are, you need his word like a baby needs milk. And I finally have some life experience under my belt to be able to speak to something, you know, as a man and say, I know that a baby needs milk because they get really upset when they don't get it. <laughs> and I see some of y'all, you, ro you roll in on Sunday and I can tell you have not had your milk. You're a little upset. Something's a little off. I can tell by your countenance. It has fallen. You have not been nurtured with the things of God's word. We need to be in the word, together, alone. I mean, any time we can get it, we need to be encouraged by these things. These things are written so that we may believe. Faith comes by hearing the word of Christ. Amen? So we need to hear these things. We are so fortunate to have these things laid out for us in Scripture. We can understand the fullness of the salvation that he came to bring. We can understand the fullness of his mission. We can look back and say, oh, look at all these ways that he accomplished all of Scripture when he was here on earth to do the things that the Father had given him to do. Number two, note takers, it was right and good and correct and altogether biblical for the Jews to desire Jesus in the way that they did. This was the, the little thing that I just was not getting when I was reading this. It is good for them to desire him in this way. They look to him to save him from their circumstances and to fulfill the role that God had promised them in their king. To be the righteous king, to rule with justice, to restore the kingdom, and to defeat the enemies of Israel once and for all. And so I would submit to you guys that instead of faulting them for not understanding the nature of Christ's salvation at his first coming, we ought rather to take notes, take a lesson from these first century Jews. Why? They saw Jesus as the answer because they believed God's word. They believed the scriptures, and so when they saw him, they cried out to him to save them. They believed in him. They didn't have all the information they needed at this point, but they believed in him, and we would do well to do the same. Now, like I said, we have the advantage of being able to look back and see that he came to be a different kind of savior than they were expecting at his first coming. He didn't come to the Passover to establish a physical kingdom on earth. But rather, he came to be the Passover sacrifice, right? The lamb slain for the sins of the world. But we also have to remember, we have to keep this in mind. I know that we, we are very much uh, from this pulpit concerned 
with the salvation that Jesus came to bring. Amen. I mean, we're all about making the scriptures about the gospel. Salvation from sin. But this morning, I'm going to do something crazy. Okay, this is going to be recorded. So, Lord help me. We also have to remember that apart from the salvation of our souls is that Jesus is also the one who will make all things right. All things right. Not just the salvation of our souls, but everything. Everything. His salvation will be all-encompassing. He will save not only our souls, but he will save the entire creation from the curse of the fall. Every facet of it, every part of this world of human existence, even the animals and the trees and the rocks are groaning and waiting for Jesus to return and make things new and to set things right. And he is coming back to usher in the eternal kingdom that was promised, where there will be no suffering, there will be no tears, there will be no war, there will be no evil, there will be no taxes now y'all are excited, that's right, yeah. We can do without, you know, tears, that's fine. Taxes, no. And no oppression, right? How many of you guys feel oppressed in here this morning? Hey, okay, we got a couple. Wow, okay. See, there will be none of that. You will be free from Rome. His rule, the coming rule of Jesus Christ on earth is the end of every despair and struggle and heartache of this world. Amen? And we of all people who have his word in its completion ought to live like we know this, like we acknowledge this, like we are waiting for this, we're anticipating this. We know what he accomplished on the cross, right? We know that he is coming back to finish what he started, to bring it to its completion. And we know that in this life, we will have what? Tribulation. We will have pain. We will have struggle. We will have tribulation. But instead of waiting and longing for him to be the satisfaction of our desires here on earth, we chase after lesser things, don't we? We try in vain to satisfy ourselves here and now, and we know it will never work, but we got to give it a shot anyway, right? We know that winning the lottery destroys people, but I'm going to give it a shot, right? I'm different. Yeah, I'm different. <laughs> we chase after lesser things. We have to remember that Jesus will bring to pass every word that has been spoken about him. But right now, we live in the realm of not yet. Right? Already, but not yet. He has already accomplished salvation, but we have not yet seen the fullness of it. He has already conquered, but we have not yet seen the fullness of his kingdom. Not yet. It was a mystery to these guys that Christ would come twice, not once. And so they were expecting all the promises of the king, all the promises of the Messiah, to happen all together at his first coming. It was a mystery that there would be a gap between his two missions. To give himself to save the world and then to judge the world and to make all things new. And we as Christians, now in the church age, have to learn to live rightly in that gap. Knowing that he has accomplished salvation for us, but yet we wait for the fullness of what he has promised. And we must put our hope in him. Now I know that sounds redundant, we must put our hope in him. But guys, we must put our hope in him not just to save us. Yes, absolutely. Put your hope in Christ to save you. But not just to save us, but in everything, our hope must be in him. This is what we learn from these first century Jews today. Our hope for everything must be in him. Everything that we are made for, that we desire, will find its fullness and its completion in whom? In Christ. Comfort, companionship, Pleasure, joy, peace, all will find their perfect and final satisfaction in him, but not yet, not now. So are you hoping, are you trusting in him for all of these things? Or are you trusting in him to get you out of hell and taking the rest into your own hands? Salvation, great. 
all the pleasure stuff, I'm going to take care of that myself because clearly you haven't taken care of that, so I'm going to go get these things for myself, right? May we be like the crowds here on Palm Sunday and hope in him even for our human desires, not just for our need to be saved from sin, but the circumstantial things, the political things, the economic things, the personal desires, all of it, all of it we must hope in him. We must continually learn through the suffering of this life to trust all things to him. Amen? Amen. It is through suffering that we learn these things. And so, so often we're crying out to him to take the suffering away, right? We want heaven here and now, right? What's the the catchphrase? This is going to be the new one for Calvary Napa. As in heaven, so in Napa. Hallelujah. (laughs) Right? Never. It's not going to happen, guys. Heaven is not going to come down because we want it to so badly and make everything perfect here in this life and in this world. It's just not reality, and so we've got to live in light of that. We've got to hope in those things that are to come and trust him in the meantime. Trust him in the midst of suffering. Amen? All right, let's keep rolling. Verse 14. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. So this is a fulfillment of the prophet Zechariah, chapter 9. And no doubt, the people present knew this prophecy. And uh, it reads this way in the, in the original uh, prophetic language of Zechariah. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, On a colt, the foal of a donkey. So by riding this donkey into Jerusalem, Jesus is proclaiming publicly, I am the king. And at the end of his ministry here, at the height of his ministry, he finally steps out into the public and makes a clear statement in fulfilling this prophecy, saying, I am the promised one. I am the righteous one. I am the one who comes having salvation. And to God's glory, the people recognize this, and they receive him for who he is. They did hope in him for salvation. But the thing was, they couldn't even comprehend how great of a salvation it would truly be. They wanted freedom, and he came to set them free indeed. Amen? So much speculation has been made about this donkey and its significance. Some point to the donkey as nothing more than a sign of Jesus' humility. But there's actually quite a lot to this animal, and I'm not going to belabor it unnecessarily. But suffice it to say, the donkey was not a despised animal. It wasn't like, oh, he's riding on a donkey. Well, that's pretty lame. Uh, the, The donkey was actually a noble creature to ride. In fact, Solomon, the son of David, was placed on his father's donkey, in order to publicly announce that the throne had rightfully passed to him. And now we see, almost a thousand years later, the greater son of David will also ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. Not only that, there's one more significant piece to the donkey. It's the age-old question. Why was Jesus on a donkey instead of a majestic stallion, right? Why didn't he roll in on a Clydesdale and just... You know, just looking awesome, all decked out in armor and all that good stuff. Well, there is an answer to that. In the ancient Middle East, rulers would ride horses into battle or as a sign of war, and they would ride donkeys when coming in peace. This is why Jesus is seen on a donkey at his first coming, and we are told in Revelation 19 that he will return riding what? A horse. Why? He's come to make war, right? Verse 11 of Revelation 19, Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. 
And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh was a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. The entrance of Jesus on the young donkey declared that he was, in fact, the king that Israel were waiting for. And that he was a king who had come not to make war. Right? The time had not yet come for war. But a king who came to make peace between God and man. A humble king. A king who set aside his estate to take the form of a servant, to learn obedience through suffering, to lay his life down. He himself being the author of life, he gave himself to be tortured and executed by his own creatures in order to satisfy this very wrath that we see in Revelation 19, to satisfy the wrath of the Father that they had brought upon themselves. And there is no greater humility than this, for a king to become a servant, for God to become a man. And there is no greater love than this, than that one what? Lay down his life for his friends. A humble king, a servant king. He came for this very reason to be lifted up. To be lifted up. He came to be lifted up on the cross, which you can't see because it's behind the screen, so that all would look to him to be saved. He came to be lifted up on the cross, and he came to be lifted up. He came that his name would be exalted to the highest place, the name above every other name, the name at which every knee will bow. The King of kings, the righteous one who purchased salvation for all peoples with his own blood. Skip down to verse 47 of chapter 12. He says, I did not come to judge the world, but what? To save it. To save the world. Christians now in this time, in, in this gap, while we are waiting between his first coming and his second coming when he will make all things new, now is the time for him to gather his sheep. The door is open. Enter into it while there is still time. He has done all that is needed. He is all sufficient. He is a perfect Savior. If you trust in Him, you will have eternal life given to you freely by His grace. There is a reason that the rest of God's promises have not yet been fulfilled. There's a reason He didn't come and save and bring war and peace and war and wrath and justice and salvation all at once. And that is... Because during this time, he is gathering his own. You guys know 2 Peter 3, 9? The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, right? He's not taking a nap. He's not wasting time. But he is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. There is a reason that he didn't do this all at once. And that was to gather a people for himself in the meantime. Now is that time. Now is that time. It is because of God's patience alone that there is still the invitation to come to Christ. Do not neglect this great salvation. For John 12, 48 says this, The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. Guys, I hate to break it to you, but if you have sat in this room this morning, you are now responsible for this information. There's no going back. There's no more hiding. There's no more denying. I have now placed the burden of Jesus' words on you. Receive them, please, if you have not already. You will be judged by his words if you choose to reject him, but why in the world would you? To, to not give up the pleasures of this life. They're fleeting, they're passing away, and you're going to have to give them up anyway when you kick the bucket, amen? You can't take them with you. 
You can't take your dollars with you. You can't take your hobbies with you. You can't take your depravity with you. Let it go. Verse 16, chapter 12. We'll finish here. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard that he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Again, I say, Christian, be grateful for the Word of God. Be grateful for the Word of God. It is by it that we lay hold of God's great promises, that we can see the prophecies of Christ coming to pass, boom, 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 that we too might believe in Him for the things that He did, as the crowds did when they heard of the signs that He has performed. They believe in Him. He alone can raise the dead. That's a sign that only he can perform, and he will raise us as he himself rose. Look at verse 19. The Pharisees are dejected at all the fuss that is being made about Jesus. They love their place of authority, and they cannot stand the fact that people are turning to Jesus and following after him. And they say to each other, look, this is bad. Our renown, our place, our authority, our, our, uh, our, our glory is being taken from us. We are losing out here, guys. We are losing, and the world has gone after him. We can't lose to this miracle worker, this blasphemer who claims to be God's son. And now they say the whole world, they say the world has gone after him. Now they were probably exaggerating here, right? They're a little upset. They're like, oh, man, the whole world's going after Jesus. We, we blew it, you know. We lost everything. It's all, it's wrecked. We got to put an end to this. They were probably exaggerating. But the cool fact is that the news about Jesus would go out to the whole world. And the whole world will be turned upside down and changed by the events that we are reading today. The raising of Lazarus, the triumphal entry, the reception of the king. And this is what we want to see in this time of waiting, in this time of not yet, where we wait for the fullness of God's promises. We want to see the world turn from their idols and go after him. We know that he will return one day soon and that he will make all things right. He will honor and reward his children. He will come back for his bride and he will come with a sword for this earth and judge those who rejected him. We want to see his salvation while we wait. Amen? Do we? Good. Invite someone next week. Just kidding. Shameless plug. Uh, We want to see people hear and read these things that he did so that they may believe and have life in his name. Right? And while we wait, guys, we want to wait well. We want to wait well. Our Lord came to be a suffering Savior. He came to be a suffering servant. And so we should expect that we will incur difficulty and suffering in this life if we are going to be faithful to Him. He obeyed the Father perfectly to the letter. And what happened to Him? He was betrayed, abandoned, and put to death for it. Guys, a servant is not above his master. We have the New Testament scriptures, which the Jews on Palm Sunday did not have, that make it clear to us that Christ came and accomplished our peace with God. But he has not promised to fulfill all of our desires in this life. He has not promised that. He's not promised to deliver us from all our oppressors in this life. He's not promised to heal us from all our diseases in this life, all of our aches, all of our sicknesses. He's not promised to give us comfort in this life, at least not earthly speaking, or even to protect us from horrific and painful deaths. I know that's kind of gruesome, 
But I know that's a lot of our worst fear is to go down in a blaze of suffering glory, right? I mean, none of us want to die a horrific and painful death, but yet we see that Christians from the first century until this very day, they die in this very same way. Horrific deaths, painful deaths, torture, brutality, oppression, all of these things. So how do we look at these things and say, well, what do I do with this? Why isn't Jesus stopping these things? Why doesn't he protect these people from this? Well, any such notion of the Lord in this sense is only, it, I don't know how else to put it other than to say it's a first world fantasy. It's a first world fantasy that we can present to Jesus to people who's going to fix all these things here in this life. That is not what he came to do at his first coming. He came to make peace between man and God through his suffering, through his death, through his burial, through his resurrection and his ascension. This is the Jesus that we are to offer to the world, to proclaim to the world, to bring to the world and say, this is the Savior. He has come to deal with the problem of sin. He has not come to make this life cozy. Amen? Do we understand that? Do we really understand that? When we're talking to other people about him, is this the Jesus that we're trying to pitch? Jesus is the one who's going to fulfill all your desires. He's the one who's going to save you from your oppressors and your diseases and your sicknesses. And he's going to make life amazing. And it's going to be an upward trajectory toward glory every single day of your life, right? It's going to be upward and onward Christian soldier every day as a W, right? We're just going to win, 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 win because of Jesus. Is that reality? Is that what you guys experience? Has anyone in here experienced that for your entire life as a Christian? A little bit. Okay, praise the Lord. <laughs> God's chosen. Uh, man, this life is hard. This life is hard, and, and for now, we must cling to what he has already done. He has made us right with God. If we can believe that, if we can rest in that, then we have all we need for now. Because sometimes, folks, that is truly all that we have. It's all that we got. In this city, in this state, in this country, in this half of the globe, we don't see this, right? We don't understand that this is really all that we have because we have so much else, right? I don't see anybody in here with super raggedy looking clothes and, you know, starving, emaciated, in fear for your life coming into this building, right? We got cozy chairs, we got coffee, we got donuts, we have restrooms, amen? Praise God, right? We don't perceive our need. We don't perceive how desperate we truly are because we are surrounded by so much comfort. But if we are going to proclaim the gospel faithfully, it cannot include material comforts at all because there are many, many, many places in the world where there are no material comforts to be had, right? We confuse this with the gospel. We get it twisted up thinking that Jesus is going to make people's lives better. He's going to be with us in our suffering. That is our hope. There is coming a day when suffering will end. But right now, what we have is that he has made peace between us and God. We have peace with our maker. We have forgiveness. We've been made alive. We've been made his. And we know that his ways are better than ours. And if that be all that we have, glory to God, right? If we are all simultaneously beheaded on our way out of this building, we have infinitely beyond what we deserve. Amen? Amen. Do you believe that? Amen. We have infinitely more than what we deserve in Christ Jesus. Some of you in this room are sick, and I know it. Some of you are hurting. Some of you are dying. I know that too. Some of you are heartbroken. Some of you are lonely. Some of you are depressed. Some of you are lost. There will come a day when all of that will be gone, forever eradicated, replaced by his perfect joy. But he has not promised that now. And so we must be diligent to remember that Jesus Christ came to this world to save sinners of which we are all greatly guilty, of which we are all in desperate need. 
Is his salvation enough? Are his promises enough? Can we trust him when we call out to him, Hosanna, save us now? Can we trust him that he knows what we suffer, having suffered himself? Can we trust that he is using suffering to accomplish something greater than if he removed it? Let me say that again. Can we trust that he is using suffering to accomplish something greater than if he removed it? Is he in control? Does he know? Does he empathize with us? Has he suffered more than any of us will ever suffer? Yes. Can we trust that he will return and to be the one thing that satisfies our every longing? Yes, we can. Why? Because he rose from the grave. Amen? He rose from the grave. He said, I'm going to die and I'm going to rise. And he died and he rose. And I'm not going to spoil Easter because he hasn't even died yet. So we've got to get to Good Friday first. So Good Friday, 5 o'clock, come enjoy food and fellowship with us. 6.30, we'll be in here to worship. And then Easter Sunday, we celebrate the resurrection. We can believe all of this because Jesus did, in fact, rise from the grave. Amen? Hallelujah. Rejoice. All right. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word, God. It is a privilege beyond our comprehension, Lord, that you would have your prophets speak by your Holy Spirit, that you would speak through your apostles, that you would speak through your Son, uh, that we might hear of his great works and believe in him and have life and have rejoicing at our King, have hope of eternal life, have the hope of the future glory that awaits that is not worthy to be compared with our current sufferings, God. We thank you that the good that is to come is so good, that the goodness of the good is so good that it can't even be compared with the bad that we now see in front of us. Please help us to walk by faith, Father, this week. Not in blind faith, but in seeing in seeing the works of our Lord and seeing him raised from the dead and seeing him exalted and lifted up. May we walk trusting, God, that you will come through on your word because you've done it throughout all history and you will not fail. We believe, Father, that we have peace with you through your Son and we believe that he is coming back for us. And that hope, God, is all that we have in this life. So please remind us today of our identity in Christ that we are washed by his royal blood. As we cry out to him, Jesus, your majesty, we trust in you alone. We give you honor and glory and thanksgiving this morning. And I give you thanks for these saints, Father. Thank you that you have made them your children. I just pray, God, that you'll strengthen them, refresh their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus this morning, and empower them, God. Uh, to seek your face and your word this week. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace.